The next Philosophy Portal course focuses on the concept and the tradition of Christian atheism. The course starts October 20th, and more information can be found at philosophyportal.online. Throughout the course, we will be developing themes of modern philosophy in relationship to the project of Christian atheism, including German idealism, Hegelo-Marxism, Nietzsche and psychoanalysis, Altizer's Gospel, Zizek's philosophy, and Rollins' theology. The course will also feature guest lectures from Slavoj Zizek, Peter Rollins, and Barry Taylor. To learn more, visit philosophyportal.online. Philosophy is most real when it to risk itself, that is, to tarry with the present moment and what is real to the history of world society. Today, I think one of the most important tasks for philosophy is to prepare itself for a revival of interest in both religion and theology, and specifically in the context of Western society, Christianity. There is a renewed interest in the distinctions of both historical Christianity, the temporal splits and ruptures which constitute major denominational identifications, as well as institutional Christianity, the specific distribution of denominational spatial distinctions, as well as the importance and the relation of Christianity to liberalism and secularity in general. If philosophy ignores or does not prepare itself for engaging with this ground, it risks either regressing to a pre-modern form of philosophy, trapped in problems, issues, and perspectives that have been resolved in the past centuries of modernity, or it risks obfuscating the real tensions and contradictions of the present moment, the real of human society and world civilization, as it relates to both the religious or theological background of history. In this series, which is preparing for a course on the same topic, we will be focused on the philosophical foundations for thinking the active and live, monstrous contradiction of Christianity and atheism, something that is actually made possible with a proper analysis of modern philosophy. Christian atheism is an important concept because it seeks to hold the monstrous contradiction between the two forms, as opposed to viewing these concepts as separate and irreconcilable. In this preview course, and in the course itself, we will be attempting to hold these concepts as inseparable moments to really think, live, and work in Western society today, and possibly also in global society. Here, the basis for this work will be the philosophical tradition starting with Immanuel Kant, and will attempt to demonstrate that what this philosophical tradition has been thinking, living, and working through in the past centuries is perhaps most productively and creatively understood as the work of a Christian atheist project. First, we need to understand the key turn in modern philosophy, which arguably coincides not with the beginning of Enlightenment, as we will often hear in popular discourse today, but rather with its end. Here we find a move from a worldview offering a consistent narrative, a coherent whole, towards its opposite, the exposure of cracks and antinomies. To be specific, the role of the modern philosopher is not to give you or offer you a consistent and a coherent worldview, for example, a specific Christian denomination, or, for that matter, a scientific background, like a Newtonian universe, or an evolutionary science universe. The role of the modern philosopher is to expose you to a deeper understanding of the cracks and the antinomies of the present moment, in such a way as that we increase the probability for the liberation of thought and thinking processes as such. Modern philosophy, therefore, is coextensive with the end of what creator and founder of Theory Underground, David McCarricker, calls worldview salesman. Anyone who is trying to be a quote-unquote worldview salesman is, 
let's say the antithesis of a true modern philosopher. To be specific, this is all made possible with the role of Kantian philosophy in this shift. Again, the exposure of cracks and antinomies in knowledge, vis-a-vis or in relationship to a perfect rational model of a general being. Here we can understand pre-Kantian philosophy, and to simplify to the extreme, as tending towards a Platonic model, that is suggesting that all actuality, everything that we sense and perceive in the world, is but an imperfect copy of a perfect form, whether that be an animal or an object. We can also see that this pervades a lot of what calls itself modern science. Consider, for example, that Nicholas Copernicus, one of the early founders of modern science and revolutionizer of astronomy, still depended on the idea of perfect orbits. In other words, while Copernicus could reconcile with the Earth not being in the center of the known universe, what he could not reconcile with was the lack of a perfect model for the orbits of the planets. The orbits had to be represented as perfect, even if this disagreed with prediction. Thus we can think of pre-modern philosophy operating with a type of perfect forms background that functions like a background dependence for thinking and analysis of sense perception or appearances. Again, even if this background dependence was actually counterproductive in relationship to explaining our perceptions and appearances of reality. We might want to use here the metaphor that a perfect background dependence is almost like having training wheels on a bike when you are learning to think, and removing those training wheels can be terrifying or provoke fear that you're going to fall off the bike and not be able to sustain your drive. Here we can understand Kant as daring to remove the training wheels, and daring to ride the bike, so to speak, even if it means we could fall in our confrontation with the abyss of rational antinomies without background. In Christian terms, we find the movement from God as a perfect substantial model of being to Christ as a crack or an antinomy in being itself. Many religions before Christianity as well as many non-dialectical forms of Christianity, function with a perfect God background as opposed to exposing the crack or the antinomy internal to this background itself. When we think of the notion of Brahma, Yahweh, Allah, we are often thinking about the notion of God as an absolute background for our activity, our morality, our behavior, our guidance, and so forth. In Christianity, this absolute background what we might want to call the Father, becomes incarnate in a particular individual human being in a specific and singular time and space, what we call Christ or the Son. And this individual human being walked a path that had to increasingly accept the abyss of the background, that there was no perfect model to save him from his fate and his confrontation not only with death, but with a violent murder of being scapegoated, betrayed, hated, and vilified, on top of that, unjustly. Here we can see this same movement, a movement away from a perfect model and towards a crack or an antinomy in our knowing that is abyssal. However, in Kantian philosophy, This must be situated in response not to Christianity or to any other pagan religions, but to the emergence of Newtonian science, and specifically the background notions that we refer to as absolute space and time. While Newtonian science presupposes absolute space and time as ontological realities containing all existence, a type of background dependence, Kant describes Newton's notion of absolute space and time as, quote, two eternal and infinite self-subsistent non-entities, which are there, yet without there being anything real, only in order to contain in themselves 
all that is real. End quote. Thus, what is most real in Newtonian science, the eternal and the infinite categories of absolute space and time, become imaginary in German idealism, non-entities, which, again, are there, yet without there being anything real, only in order to contain in themselves all that is real. This difference between Newtonian science and Kantian philosophy has been not only understudied, but poorly translated into a new practical relation between science and philosophy that could actually have real consequences for contemporary domains of quantum physics and cognitive science. Regarding quantum physics, we are being challenged today to think science without a Newtonian background dependence. And regarding cognitive science, we are being challenged today to think more deeply about the ways our own cognitive influences and structures influence the way we understand reality itself. In this sense, both are deeply Kantian problems. Kant suggests that we should view Newton's notions of absolute space and time as sources of knowledge as opposed to things in themselves. In this sense, Kant turns Newton's ontological project into an epistemological one, leaving open the question of things in themselves, or simply, reality. In other words, and as pointed out by psychoanalytic philosopher Elenka Zupancic, when we think of the Newtonian project after Kant, what we are thinking is not that Newton gives us access to the ultimate real, but rather that Newton gives us the capacity to, among other things, fly to the moon. In other words, we are thinking from the perspective of Newtonian physics as a source of knowledge that can help us act in the world, as opposed to thinking about Newtonian physics as an access to reality itself. We could summarize the transition as a move from an unreflexive ontology of general being, absolute space and time, to a reflexive epistemology of knowing that can help us again do things in the world that would otherwise be impossible, like go to the moon. This again reflects something similar to what we see in the story of Christ, where a general background of an absolute reality becomes a process of knowing that is riddled and constituted by a difficult yet exciting adventure. Kant's philosophy also can be framed positively, namely not simply in terms of what it is against, his philosophy positively is referred to as a transcendental philosophy, specifically focused on what we call the transcendental constitution of reality. Let's break this down for a moment. The transcendental constitution of reality versus reality in itself. Here we have to think about the way that our mind structures the way in which reality appears to us so that we could describe it in terms of space and time, or, classically, a general notion of being. The transcendental constitution for Kant is structured by a priori categories of the understanding. These categories determine how we understand reality, in terms of space and time. It is almost as if Newton's externality becomes Kant's internality, we can again make parallels with the dialectical metaphor of God and Christ, in the sense that God as an external substance becomes Christ as an internal subject. Thus, after Kant, we are no longer looking for an external agency to guarantee our notion of a total reality, but we are looking to understand the way our own internal structure predisposes us to this understanding of externality. It raises the bar in terms of self-reflection. And this is many ways what Kantian philosophy is trying to do. To be precise, it's trying to raise the bar in terms of our self-reflection. Kant demands of us that we confront our own internal limits, specifically the limits of our capacity to know, to know everything or the all of being. We cannot know everything or the all of being, 
because what we have thought of as everything or the all of being is actually only our own transcendental constitution of that reality. The fundamental key distinction here is the distinction between things as they appear and the same thing as they are in themselves. This is Kant's Copernican term. Things as they appear are, are filtered through our transcendental categories, vis-a-vis -vis not reality in itself, but our sensibility, our sense perception of things in themselves. This means that our given structure of sense perception, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, our touch, these structures of sense perception are what our a priori categories are attempting to repetitively synthesize, to transform a chaotic multitude into a coherent one. We can think of this as moving from one given externality, eternal, infinite, consistent and coherent in itself, to moving towards a multiplicity of ones that are tasked with the job of repetitively synthesizing external chaos and even our pathological impulses in a way that can maintain motion. In other words, in a way that can maintain our subjective, practical life engagement with the world. Here, the big question in Kantian philosophy becomes a distinction between the ideality of phenomenal appearances, which are mind-dependent, organized into notions of space and time, which we mistook to be external, and the real noumenal reality that is independent of our mind and cannot be described in terms of space and time, but rather, we might suggest, disturbs our notion of space and time, potentially something we might find chaotic and disorienting. In other words, in the fullness of the Kantian turn, we go from trying to unreflectively fit being into our general system of categories towards the task of maintaining our being as our system of categories in relationship to a noumenal dimension that is always potentially a threat to our order. One potential metaphor here is moving from a perfect external model to moving towards an internal multiplicity of modeling processes oriented or orbiting a type of black hole, qua unknowable noumenal real, independent of our minds. One of the major consequences of the Kantian turn is that appearances lose their pejorative characteristic. For example, saying, well, they are just appearances in relationship to reaching the true transcendental reality. As already mentioned, for Plato, the table in front of me or the book in front of me is only a defective or an imperfect copy of the eternal idea of a table or the eternal idea of a book. The same goes for anything, animals or orbits. In Kantian reality, there is the perception of phenomena without perfect model. In other words, and to repeat the point, there is no background support outside of our own internal categories organizing sense perception. This prevents any naive, platonic notion of finite, material, sensuous reality as the secondary or confused version of the true, intelligible, noumenal universe. This move is coextensive with a general move that coincides with a modern understanding of freedom, key to a turn in philosophy coextensive with modern politics. The transcendental subject of apperception, that is, the subject which imposes categories, transcendental categories, on sense perception, is for Kant a free act. For Kant, this dimension of freedom is not part of external noumenal reality, but rather a fact of reason. Our freedom to impose categories, to synthesize phenomena, is, when reflected, also potentially traumatic. On the deepest level, it means that it is our free choice to impose laws of nature. We choose to organize and synthesize phenomena in this way, to explain reality. This also means that we have to move to the question of not the real laws of nature, 
But why do we describe the laws of nature the way we do? How could they be described or accounted for differently? This background independence, a feature of what we could call either quantum or postmodern physics, is representing the fact that there is no objective background, and that our freedom, one might suggest, would not be possible were it not for this background independence. If it were not for background independence, perhaps we would just be automata, thinking machines, robotic artificial intelligence. Metaphorically, this move to a modern sense of freedom could also be productively connected to the transcendental dialectical metaphor of the trauma in moving from God to Christ. Christ's existence is free, independent of a godly background, but at the same time traumatic, open to betrayal, scapegoating, not only in death, but a violent murder by a mob. Perhaps then the rise of Christian thinking again in our culture is coextensive with the rise of thinking machines and artificial intelligence, where we have to think again from the foundations. What it is about the human subject, metaphorically inscribed here in the image and life of Christ, means for our freedom. For Kant, the answer to the fact of our freedom was found in the transcendental subject's capacity to continuously enact the transcendental synthesis of apperception. This is the equivalent to introducing and upholding the moral law against a chaotic background, as well as our pathological impulses. Kant referred to this act as the categorical imperative. Here we can find in Kant the resources to distinguish post-Kantian philosophy and Christianity as barring access to a fundamentalist morality in the sense of an external transcendental guarantee. In post-Kantian philosophy and Christianity, the moral law depends and coincides with our free act, our capacity to impose symbolic order onto madness, chaos, and pathological impulse. This does not result in a worldview, but rather a commitment to the thinking process as what brings the multitude of sensibilities into a one, or a system of categories, that can only be repetitively enacted. This concludes our first pre-course introduction to Christian atheism. What we basically covered here was the importance of Kantian philosophy, its historical context, its intellectual reaction, as well as its core features in the introduction of the transcendental philosophy. And most importantly for our purposes, the way in which this philosophy can be understood as introducing the question and the problem and the project of Christian atheism. Rendered most clearly in the metaphorical connection between the dialectical movement of God to Christ, a movement in which the absolute background reality becomes a particular historical subjectivity. While pre-Kantian philosophy would perhaps substantialize this dialectic in the actual historical figure of Christ, post-Kantian philosophy is wrestling with this movement in the transcendental genesis of every world historical subject. That is, every subject that raises the bar of self-reflection and takes what appears to be an externally given absolute substance or background, perhaps providing safety and security, and raises it to the level of the condition of possibility for the appearance of reality to itself, which is again, taking that training wheel off the bike and learning how to drive oneself. Throughout the rest of the series, we will investigate how this crucial transcendental turn may have implications for not only modern philosophy, but also for the project of Christian atheism. The next Philosophy Portal course focuses on the concept and the tradition of Christian atheism. The course starts October 20th, and more information can be found at philosophyportal.online. Throughout the course, we will be developing themes of modern philosophy in relationship to the project of Christian atheism, including German idealism, Hegelo-Marxism, Nietzsche and psychoanalysis, Altizer's gospel, Zizek's philosophy, and Rollins' theology. The course will also feature guest lectures from Slavoj Zizek, Peter Rollins, and Barry Taylor. 
To learn more, visit philosophyportal.online. The third Philosophy Portal anthology, Logic for the Global Brain, is now available. To pick up a copy, visit philosophyportal.online. Starting in 2024, Philosophy Portal opened the portal, a live event space dedicated to making philosophy actual. Every month, we host four events organized under a common theme, designed to build different discursive spaces to learn concepts, explore the edge of thinking, learn from thought leaders, and get personal about our intellectual journeys. Members get access to a living thinking community and access to the entire history of events, as well as discounts on recorded and future courses. Couples are very much encouraged and get a two-for-one discount. To learn more, visit philosophyportal.online and consider becoming a member today. The Portal. The Work of the Concept.